Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, and thank you for joining our faculty's uh, conversation series. My name is Nazem Chichek. I'm the Associate Dean Research in the Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences here at the University of Manitoba. The title of today's seminar is Advancing Animal Nutrition and Health, a spotlight on a successful industry academia collaboration. Before I begin, let me start by stating that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of the Anishinaabe, Ininu, Anisi Ininu, Dakota and Dene peoples, and on the national homeland of the Red River Métis. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories, we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So if you're new to our faculty conversation series, it's basically a virtual seminar series that highlights some of the innovative work that happens here in our faculty. And if you have missed our previous seminars, there is an opportunity for you to view them on our faculty's YouTube channel or uh, on our Manitoba Agriculture and Food Knowledge Exchange website or MAKE. So makemanitoba.ca is a place where our faculty highlights its research as it relates to both producers and consumers. And there's links there for resources such as podcasts, uh, videos, fact sheets, infographics, and even some recipes. Okay, so today we have three speakers who will share with us a short summary of their work and then engage in a conversation. So you as a viewer can participate in that conversation by sending your questions and comments via the chat platform Slido. So let me turn it over to Crystal. Uh, Crystal Jorgensen, the faculty's communication specialist, so she can provide you with some guidance on how you can participate. Crystal? Thanks, Nazem. Uh, welcome to everybody who's joined us here today. We're hoping that you can help us out with some questions for our speakers. Uh, to do that, you're going to open another browser window and visit www.slido.com, or slido.com, both work. Um, and enter the event code hashtag animal health, all one word. Um, feel free to start asking questions right off the hop. And when we get to the Q&A, we'll work our way through them in a chronological order. Uh, the question field is a little bit limited in character count. So we're just asking that you keep your questions succinct. And to kick it off, I'd love to hear where people are tuning in from today. And with that, Nazem, I'll turn it back to you and we'll revisit these instructions a little bit later. Okay, great. Thanks, Crystal. So we will review those instructions once again uh, right at the beginning of the Q&A section. But let's go on to our conversation. So collaborations with industry partners play a critical role in the research and training mission of an applied science faculty such as ours. These partnerships help drive discovery, facilitate technology transfer and innovation, and certainly enhance training in ways that the individual organizations may not be able to accomplish by themselves. Our conversation today will explore a unique relationship that has been ongoing for 30 years between the University of Manitoba and CBS Bioplatforms, Inc. CBS began as Canadian Biosystems, Inc., a feed technology company founded by a faculty alum, uh, Owen Jones, in 1984, and a partnership developed between CBS and the U of M, which resulted in an internationally renowned research program. In recognition of their many contributions to research, Canadian Biosystems Inc., along with the U of M professors, Dr. Bogdan Slominski, Dr. Martin Nayachodi, and others in the Department of Animal Science, received the prestigious NSERC Synergy Award for Innovation in 2002. And then again in 2006, the group received the National Research Council Alberta Science and Technology Innovation in Industrial Research Award. So today's conversation will bring together two of the U of M's researchers currently involved in, animal, in the animal nutrition program, along with a representative from CBS BioPlatforms. So we'll get to learn about the discoveries they have made together, as well as the new areas of research this has opened up. Another thing to note is that the collaboration has allowed the training of many highly qualified personnel, some of whom are now working in the animal nutrition sector and academia generally. So let me start by introducing you to our guest today. So uh, please help me welcome Dr. Martin Nayachodi, 
who's a professor in the Department of Animal Science at the University of Manitoba. Uh, Dr. Naichori is uh, a research focuses on nutrition and gut health in non-ruminants, energy and nutrient utilization, and feed ingredient evaluation. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Mark. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nassim. I'm happy to be here to participate in this conversation today. Um, just uh, a little bit about uh, what we do here. Uh, as uh, animal nutritionists, our focus has been uh, uh, on uh, helping the industry uh, deal with some of the main challenges that they face, uh, mainly uh, in terms of supplying feed and making sure that the nutrients that are contained in that feed are utilized uh, appropriately. So the work that we've been doing is focused on uh, improving uh, production efficiency and industry resilience. And uh, specifically, we are focused on how to improve energy and nutrient utilization using enzyme technology. That's a research that we've worked on uh, for, for a long time. And uh, based on that research, we've also learned that we can apply enzymes in other areas, uh, for example, impacting areas of animal health by developing or taking advantage of components that are in the feed that may uh, positively influence um, gut health in animals. Um, we've done this by trying to characterize raw materials that are used for feed, uh, to make feed for non-ruminant animals and to understand what they bring to the formula and trying to see how we can enhance utilization of components in those raw materials. Um, this is important because then uh, uh, it enhances uh, the long-term sustainability of the livestock industry from our point of view. Thank you. Thank you for this introduction, Martin. That's great. Um, we're not going to turn it over to welcome Dr. Anna Rogevich, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Animal Science. And Anna's particular interest and expertise is on nutritional biochemistry, carbohydrates, feed enzyme technology, and prebiotic effects of bioactive feed ingredients, as well as poultry nutrition. So I'm going to turn it over to Anna right now. Go ahead, Anna. Thank you, Nazim. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I really, really am um, glad being here, and I'm glad that we are talking about uh, about this such um, um, collaboration. I wanted to add a little, in addition to what Martin just outlined, uh, the uh, accomplishment in the research, that the the successful collaboration usually leads also to the to training of many students, and uh, we are proud to have quite a quite a few alumni who've been uh, involved in the collaborative research with the CBS Bio platforms over several years. They um, overall join them. Um, um, uh, they serve the Canadian Canadian livestock industry in a various capacity. Also, they join us. Uh, they 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 do their career as academics. We've got a, quite a few alumni that they serve in the federal and provincial governments. Um, the research specialists as well that the feed uh, work with the, in the feed companies and food companies as well, and uh, and also work for the, some commodity groups, Manitoba egg farmers being an example. So we are we're very glad, and with the funding support from the industry partner, um, we. Um, we've been um, able to attract the significant matching funds from the provincial and federal um, funding programs. And over the years, we may say successively um, conducted research with the, with NSERC, uh, with the uh, Kenyan Poultry Research Council. We also been involved in the cluster science um, programs like swine cluster, barley cluster, poultry cluster canola science cluster, so so uh, that's very successful. And as research progresses, we still got, we still continue teaching and training um, individuals. And the involvement of, of uh, CBS as a, as a partner significantly enhanced the training. We give students the, the perspective, not only from academia, but industrial perspective. We implement the the innovative feed technologies. Um, we uh, talk and, uh, and uh, teach them about the uh, sustainable sustainable nutrition practices that will yield the positive effect on environment and animal production, food food production, and um, and so on, animal welfare. 
and also through the publications and uh, and um, uh, numerous conference presentations, engaging in the popular articles, we are we able to to showcase not only the research outcomes but also demonstrate how the collaboration could, can foster the innovative and uh, and enhance also the institutional image. So uh, so that's that's other other very significant um, um, effect of the of the collaboration. Thank you. Great, thanks for that, Anna. And really important to highlight the training. And you mentioned alumni, and we have one of those alumni joining us today. So let me introduce Rob. Uh, Rob Patterson is the uh, Vice President of Innovation and Commer Commercialization at CBS Bioplatforms. And Rob has both a BSc and an MSc from the University of Manitoba in the area of nutritional biochemistry. Uh, prior to becoming the vice president, uh, he has served as technical director for Canadian Biosystems and resp was responsible for technology commercialization, including research and development, uh, regulatory and quality systems oversight, sales and marketing, and business development activities. So I'm going to turn it over to Rob for some introductory remarks. Take it away, Rob. Thanks for the introduction, Azim. I am excited to be here. Uh, as you mentioned, I am one of the uh, products of this collaboration um, as an alum from, from the department. And uh, interesting enough, it, uh, it shows what a small world Manitoba is and Winnipeg specifically, uh, because my former supervisor is on this, uh, on, on this conversation as well uh, with, with, with Martin Yachody. Uh, so it makes it extra special for me to be here. And so yeah, uh, a, a background in nutrition and, and immunology. And, and so what I do in my current role as vice president uh, of innovation and commercialization is I'm responsible for full cycle technology development. And that means everything from being uh, partners in collaborations, uh, longstanding ones, 30 year plus here at the University of Manitoba, as well as uh, institutions around the world. And we, our job is to take the ideas that these very smart people generate and turn them into tangible products and technologies that can serve producers at the farm gate. And CPS Bioplatforms is an agri-feed technology company. And what that means is we produce technologies that farmers use to improve their everyday performance and profitability of their, of their operations, be it from replacing antibiotics, improving feed nutrition, uh, improving profitability and providing solutions uh, in an ever-changing world of commodities and ingredients uh, that, that's become very small in terms of a, a global network. And the partnerships that we have at the University of Manitoba uh, really do serve to facilitate a pipeline of, of ideas and innovation. And uh, I'm happy to be here and, and discuss that uh, with the group. Great, thank you so much, Rob, for that. And uh, I'm, uh, yeah, welcoming all of you to this table now. I want to start the conversation with sort of a really general point, a long-term relationship, the one that you have built uh, together. You know, that's not easy to find. Occasionally we see industry academia partnerships that last for a certain period of time, and then either one party or the other moves on. So obviously there's particular attributes to this relationship that have made this a sustainable partnership. Do you care to comment on what those attributes might be from your end if you had to reflect back and say, okay, th these are the things that made this long-term relationship succeed. Maybe I'll start with Rob first and then turn it over to Mark and Anna. Yeah, you don't, I, uh, I'm on the second generation. And so the founder of the company, Owen Jones, he's an alum as well. He graduated uh, from the Department of Animal Science um, many years ago and went into industry and came back. And one of the reasons he came back in um, uh, and, and formed this partnership, this initial research project, was there were uh, not very many places he could go uh, you know, to answer questions about products that he was developing at the time. And uh, the Department of Animal Science and the Faculty of Agriculture made that establishment, uh, that relationship establishment very easy. It's a very industry focused faculty. Uh, you know, if you've spent any time with, with the professors and, and um, uh, across the disciplines, you know, there always has to be that industry focus. We're doing, we're doing research for the farmer. 
know, there's a lot of basic research that gets done. Obviously, we need to push the envelope, but it always has to be industry focused. And so that mindset was uh, uh, quite present when when Owen Jones, you know, initiated this this partnership. And so that that just facilitated um, uh, a good baseline to build from. And it hasn't changed, you know, uh, that initial project that started in, I think, 1992. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, the, the professors that were there at the time, some are still around uh, as emeritus, of course, uh, and some have trained through there, but that 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 farm gate focus is still there. And so that that really helps foster this this partnership to keep going. Great. And uh, Martin, from the academia perspective, you've been in this relationship for a long time. What do you see as the main attributes that lead to success in such collaborations from your perspective? Very good. Um, um, indeed, uh, I think there are some key elements that have uh, made it possible for these relations to thrive, uh, in addition to what uh, Rob has just indicated, uh, to thrive for such a long time. Uh, one of those from where I sit here is the fact that uh, port parties are actually interested in finding solutions. Uh, finding solutions to practical problems that uh, face the industry. But, uh, both parties are interested in making sure that the discoveries that are made are communicated, not only internally between the two organizations, but also communicated to the wider uh, scientific community and the wider livestock industry. Uh, and that um, uh, both, you know, both parties were very interested and are still very interested in making sure that uh, the relationship actually then trains the next generation of scientists and people to serve the industry, not just the, the parties that are involved, but also the industry at, at large. So being able to have honest discussions, open discussions, uh, being able to uh, allow research results to be communicated to the rest of the world has been one of those um, of ingredients that have made this such a, a successful relationship because then uh, both parties have remained equally uh, engaged and interested in seeing uh, these uh, various uh, activities under these relationships uh, succeed. Yeah, and that can be a point of friction, right? If you think about distribution of uh, IP or knowledge and publication rights and student graduating, you know, with uh, with the, the need to, to to disperse that knowledge, but there might be some commercial interest in that. So having that solid open relationship that lets you communicate through that problem relieves that friction and uh, enables that relationship to last. But that's always a bit of a sticking point, right? Uh, how much of this can be distributed? So that's a really good point, Martin. And Anna, you've been uh, relatively new, if I want to compare that to Martin's uh, relationship with CBS, to, to this relationship. From your perspective, what? Uh, how do you see this uh, moving forward, how do you see this relationship continue? And what makes for a successful interaction between you and uh, partners such as CBS? Right. Um, I'm also the second generation, as Rob, Rob mentioned, so we carry on. The thing is, as, as um, science is developing, as companies developing, because we're always developing, um, the, the new questions, new scientific questions and new ideas are also emerging. So it seems like it's a never ending story. There will be always something new to discover. And uh, and the, with, the, with the collaboration, we may still create questions and we, we may still try to find the answers. We may go beyond what traditionally someone could think about enzymes as a feed additives. We may find other niche for enzymes to to perform or to, to add value um, on that little bit slightly different different end. And um, and CBS also develop as a company towards the, like beyond the en enzyme enzyme um, um, uh, production and so on. So so there's always niche. And uh, once again I will still talk about the the new generation, new trainees, new HQPs. Uh, we we have to we have to provide them the access to the to the good relevant science to the good knowledge to to teach them techniques and really make sure that they feel this relevance that is done for for the future so we still we still um uh, as a scientist see the field to 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 continue 
um, developing and uh, trying to answer the questions. I don't want to sound like uh, we've got the questions, we're always looking for some answers, but that's what science is all about, right? So, uh, so, so yeah, definitely there will be, uh, as, as, as we progress in companies progressing and then, and, and then, then, then I think there will be, there will be field to, to still collaborate, keep the collaboration active. Yeah, I mean, you're learning both from both ends, right? Academia is a learning environment. You're always uh, thinking about the next thing. And certainly from a business perspective, you're looking forward and understand where the landscape is. And there'll be questions to answer. We're never short of questions. I guess uh, on the training side, and I wanted to ask you all, uh, give, you, give me a bit more detail on where your trainees actually end up. And I mentioned some of that. Some end up in commodity groups, some end up in academia. But, uh, and Rob mentioned that, that the network is fairly tight, right? I mean, the community isn't that large. So you run into each other in conferences, I imagine, and you get to uh, uh, talk amongst yourself. So this, the training environment you have generated, tell me a little bit more about where these folks end up. So do, you, do we have other professors, for example, that have come out of this relationship in different universities? Um, is there people that have now taken up jobs internationally? Uh, maybe I'll start with Martin this time. Uh, Martin, do you yeah. have any insights on this? Yeah, yeah. This has actually been uh, incredibly successful in that front. And as him, um, a lot of students um, that have been trained in, under this program have gone on to take up uh, yeah, various positions. We have one professor at Aarhus University in Denmark uh, whose research masters and PhD were done under this program. We have a professor at the University of Wealth in uh, and more body science or biosciences, I think they call it right now, who was uh, here as well, did his PhD with us under this program. Um, we have a professor at the University of uh, Georgia, I mean, Mississippi State University, uh, who did a master's here. We have a professor at U of S who did a, um, a, both a PhD and MSc's here with us under this program. We have several other students uh, working in uh, in the private industry. One of the largest feed companies here in Canada has employed two of those students uh, that uh, were graduated from this program. They are serving the industry as swine nutritionists. Uh, so Anna mentioned there is um, people at uh, Manitoba Egg Farmers. Um, we have uh, postdocs that have done research here. One is a professor at the University of Chungnam uh, uh, National University in Korea, South Korea, that uh, is also right now doing a lot of collaborative work with CBS. So yeah, there is a lot of people that have uh, uh, gone through this training program that are right now in various capacities uh, around the world. Fantastic. And Rob, are, are you uh, relying on this type of pipeline to uh, for growth and staffing and maybe exploring new areas? Maybe you can comment from your end on how important training and maybe human resources are in these type yeah. of relationships. Yeah, you know, uh, it's it's one of the foundations of the network that we that we um, work and, and access. And so the individuals that Martin listed, uh, we have active collaborations uh, with that, uh, with those institutions, and, and a lot of those spurred from from you know from the University of Manitoba. Uh, what you know, I, I would just add one more. You know, as you walk around the world, you run into people. Um, and, and again, I come back to this example: if you're from Winnipeg, if you spent any time and you go around, it's it's not hard to find another Manitoban uh, out in the world. And uh, just last week, I was overseas and I ran into uh, another former graduate. Uh, of the University of Manitoba Department of Animal Science, who came through the program many, many years ago, who was then employed by one of the largest feed companies in Western Canada, decided to switch roles, move overseas. And I just ran into, into this individual just a few days ago. And uh, you always end up with the same questions. You know, what's Martin doing? What's Bill Ginter doing? What are these people doing? What's going on? Uh, and, and so, you know, th th those, those roots run deep. And, uh, and and it all it's interesting. It all not all of it, but a lot of it spur, you know finds its way back to that origin story, which is which is the department and through this through this collaboration. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, and uh, it, that's quite inspirational because you know I don't know how uh, Mark and Anna feel, but I really draw meaning from uh, the people we produce. And at the end of the day, when you look back at your career, it's the, you know it's those relationships that matter. 
Anna, you mentioned student training is a really important part of what you do. And I know you interact with lots of undergraduate students and uh, have some graduate students in your program. And you mentioned the importance of them having access to real problems and interacting with industry, right? Not just uh, doing research that might have, you know, fundamental aspects to it, but having some applied research. Mm -hmm. as well. Can you speak to that, how important that might be to them uh, to be having, uh, you know, interacting with real partners? Yeah, so th this is this is um, um, uh, quite important because we're trying to foster um, in our teaching and mentoring students that whatever we are doing is relevant. We're not building our careers; we're actually building the knowledge towards the future careers, and then having this context that there is a real, real industry partner, um, uh, and then and then the partner who is. Um, um, doing and working in agricultural um, 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 industry that really give them purpose. So uh, we're trying to answer the, the questions or design certain uh, research towards really answering the and being relevant. That is that is really important. And then we also foster the idea of the practicality. Um, uh, uh, animal nutrition, it's, um, it's an art in a sense. It's a knowledge and art have to be all have information have to be connected. So we're trying to provide it that that's why students are basically ready to really join the, the, the industry as, a, as a experts. Right. And that's very important. Uh, you know, I mean, the young people are looking for a career, right? So uh, having some uh, context, real life context is critical. Um, mm -hmm. Before I move over to uh, field some questions from our audience, I wanted to explore one more thing. And, and that came up in, in your comments. All of you talked about kind of the sustainability of the sector and generally the sustainability aspects of animal nutrition and the animal industry. Um, and that's really top and right for many people, right? And not a day goes by where we don't think about a footprint of a particular activity or how can we improve. Um, both environmental, social, and economic sustainability of practices. So I know that you work on these in these areas and you care about them. So maybe I'll start with Rob first. How important is sustainability to term and general practices in your in your industry? Well, I think it's always been important. Um, if you go back, we may not have called it sustainability. Uh, you know, we might have. Uh, that that's kind of an evolving definition and, and it's obviously that's always been important it's important now it's it, it was important back then if you think of the history of of livestock livestock were um the original spot where you could take the discards from the farm and add value to them you know uh, the, the the things that we can't eat uh, uh, you know the discarded potato peels the the corn cobs the uh the chop left over on the field uh, those would all get converted and, and fed to the animals. And because if you're running a farm, you, you can't waste anything, every penny counts. So, you know, go back a hundred years, it, it, was, it wasn't it was called sustainability, but the practices were still there. And so I think that's deep rooted as well. I keep saying that, um, but this is this is a, a, a core of, of any livestock producer, of any farmer in general, not to waste. And one of the great ways we can do that now is is through enzyme technology either as uh, a conventional use case or as more novel cutting edge use cases that that we're working on uh you know creating new value streams from undervalued commodity uh, uh ingredients and, and that that kind of work is what we're doing currently at the university of manitoba so it's always front of mind and it's it's always something that comes into the uh, equation when we're when we're thinking about how we want to innovate and how we want to develop new technology. Great, and and Mark, you had mentioned that part of your uh, research area or uh, you know projects relate to energy and nutrient utilization, which I imagine have a sustainability angle to them, as uh, you think mm -hmm. about animal feed. Did you want to comment on uh, on that and how important has it become to understand how to measure you know? The metrics of sustainability how to measure these type of uh, uh, practices and improve them yeah yeah certainly i, I can do that um and just to add on what uh, rob is saying here um 
you know, if you look at, for example, in a non-ruminant nutrition feed alone, and actually livestock production in general um, accounts for uh, well over 70% of the variable cost of producing a pig or a chicken. Uh, so it's really, really important if you look at what goes into that feed, much of it is going in there to supply energy and protein and, and the phosphorus to the, the, to the animal. Uh, so um, what we do normally is we use uh, certain ingredients. Many of them are cereal grains to supply the energy. But um, uh, some of these grains have other uses now, such as producing biofuel. Uh, making it uh, uh, difficult then to at uh, least uh, increasing the competition between livestock production and um, other uses such as biofuel production. But then we have all these core products that are, we, uh, that are becoming a variable. Uh, um, there's a lot of core products produced from the uh, human or pro trying to produce protein from uh, plant, uh, plant sources, uh, trying to extract oil for human consumption from oil seeds, all the products that are left, uh, they, they, they have a lot of nutrition, they have a lot of energy, they have a lot of protein, they are a source of various nutrients that could be used uh, to grow poultry and swine. So our goal has been to try and utilize those materials uh, or find a way of utilizing them uh, is to lower the cost of feeding, but also because they are a variable rockery to shorten the supply chain so that we don't have to haul ingredients from far away presses, uh, which is in itself is not sustainable because then uh, it contributes to the issues that we will see then in terms of uh, uh, environmental impacts. So we look at uh, how can we utilize these um, uh, ingredients better uh, by improving the utilization of the nutrients that they contain and energy. We look at how we can utilize raw materials that we have here available uh, that otherwise have not been utilized in the past, but we like to use use them to make diets for for animals, and and also um, then we look at how we can uh, better increase the efficiency of nutrient utilization. Because one other issue that is re relevant here is the amount of nutrients that are excreted in the environment. Um, many of them can have a really negative impact on the environment, but we can use technology to try and in, help the animal better utilize those nutrients so that we can minimize uh, release into the environment. Yeah, so there's a dual benefit to, to, to improve your efficiency, reduce cost, and at yeah. the same time reduce your environmental impact. So that's, that's clearly very important. And I think Rob mentioned the antibiotic uh, alternatives um, that, that uh, your group works on, and that's also quite interesting. You know, the public cares about environmental sustainability, but also cares about things like antibiotic-free uh, products, right, that they want to consume. And that's, that's becoming a, a focal point. You can see the you know, commercials and things like that, antibiotic-free uh, alternatives offered by certain restaurants and so forth. So maybe I'll, I'll turn it over to Anna. You know, you have done some prebiotic work that I think, uh, an enzyme work that relates to this area. Can you speak to this a little bit from your end? Yes, of course. As we all care about the health of our animals and the health of the entire population, we know that departuring from animal antibiotic growth promoters, that is the only way to go. Um, agriculture in general is very advanced, uh, so antibiotics may not be that, that really needed those days. However, we have to support not only animal health, and uh, digestion development, but also food safety. So, uh, so introducing probiotics, prebiotics, it's uh, it's the it's the really way to go. Um, together with the CBS and and and, uh, and other scientists, we're trying to to find the the hidden um, benefits from the um, uh, from the feed ingredients. In uh, and we are searching for prebiotic. Um, um, compounds or, or ingredients. Prebiotics will really serve the, the microbiota in the gut of animals by providing them necessary nutrients. Therefore, they may, they may perform the, the beneficial action towards the animal health and digestion. So enzyme technology may be, may be very efficiently used uh, to to really uh, produce the, uh, those those bioactive components, they may not necessarily only be the prebiotics, but they may they we may we may release some other uh, bioactivities 
from the from the feed ingredients. So taking taking um, some underutilized or or um, um, sometimes not even utilize utilize uh, feed ingredients in the monogastric um, um, animal nutrition. We're trying to really get the the some value to add the value to them by by separating prebiotics. Great. Well, that's that's great, and thank you for for um, uh, elaborating further on that. It wasn't entirely clear to me how that would work. Um, I think it might be time for us to look at uh, fielding some questions from uh, from the audience. So I'm going to turn it over back to Crystal, who can uh, remind us, uh, remind the audience, and remind us all how this is going to go. Crystal, hi everybody. Yeah. Yes. If you'd like to um, open another browser window, if you're watching in your browser, and visit www.slido.do or slido.com, both work, and use the uh, code you're seeing at the bottom of your screen there, it's hashtag animal health. Um, and you can just come right in there and start asking questions and we will do them in the order that they're coming in. Um, as I mentioned before, the character count is a bit limited, so keep your questions succinct. Um, and we did ask where people were tuning in from, and a couple of people have indicated they, they are right here in Winnipeg watching. I'm sure people are watching from other locations as well. Um, I can maybe kick it off with the very first question if you'd like, Asim. Okay, so Amy Johnson, who's uh, joined us today, she's asked, uh, you mentioned sustainability as a key focus area. Are there any other key areas of focus that you see developing in the coming years as part of this collaboration? Yeah, who, who wants to give this a go? Maybe we'll start with Martin first and then turn it to Rob and Anna next. What what does uh, the future hold in this area, Martin, from your perspective? Um, I think there is a lot. Um, it is probably, uh, in my view, it's all going to come down to why we are doing this. So I think we cannot completely detach it from uh, from sustainability, because I think the questions that we are trying to answer going forward or that would become a focus um, is, is maybe the area that Anna was talking about, um, trying to see what um, what other benefits technology such as enzymes might have. Because in the past, enzymes were mainly developed to release nutrients, energy and nutrients uh, uh, from the diet. But then I think there is accumulating evidence to show that there is probably additional benefits of having enzymes. So I think uh, uh, going forward, then it's, um, it would be to understand what are those additional benefits and uh, what materials, what raw materials uh, needs to be treated with which enzymes uh, to be able to see those uh, benefits. Uh, uh, coming to the livestock industry. So I think it's to understand a little bit more in this area to understand how best we can then uh, take advantage of enzymes beyond nutrient and energy release. Great. Uh, Rob and Anna, did you want to chime in? What, how do you see this area moving? I know it's it's a moving target. Sustainability is a kind of a buzzword uh, with everybody and uh, not, not everybody understands it the same way. Obviously, the industry wants financial sustainability, also social sustainability, kind of a a license to continue operating in many ways. The consumer needs to be well informed. But then there's the whole environmental sustainability, uh, which we mostly understand as you know reducing your footprint overall. But in in all in any of those spaces, where do you see this going? Uh, it's you know it's a bit of a crystal ball question. But uh, maybe Rob, you want to take a stab at that? It's tough because, like you said, you can define sustainability so many ways. Um, economic sustainability, obviously. Um, you know, quite literally sustaining that farm, uh, sustaining, uh, you know, as we move from first, second and third generation uh, uh, producers. So, you know, ensuring that there's the technology and, and as you mentioned, license to operate, uh, uh, that that's a big one. Uh, and it, maybe it falls outside it, and I think it does fall outside of this conversation, maybe for another uh, fireside chat of, of, of succession planning. But if it's if it's keeping to, to the technology, um, you know, within that, you know, I think the question was what's beyond sustainability. I, I, I see that being around for a long time because it is so uh, nebulous in its definition uh, where you, depending on, on, you know, where you are on any given day. Um, it, but if I was to take a shot at what is, be, what's the next best or what's the next big thing past sustainability, 
it's likely going to be um, the you know the absolute future of animal protein consumption. You know the the you know how do we coexist with with the rise and and of of popularity of, of plant based protein diets, and and what's the role of of animal protein within a complete diet on, on the human side? That's probably going to be something that that gets talked about more and more. I would think. Right. And and realigning how how production is is done, and you know things are produced in low cost environments and shipped all over the world. That's kind of been the 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 basis of, of globalization for the past say 25 30 years it's probably going to change a little bit here in the next five to ten and so you know what do those trade alignments look like um and and, and what do the products look like moving in one direction produced in a certain location and then and then move back uh, uh to another location whatever that gets defined as is probably going to be something that people talk about um more as sustainability kind of gets buttoned down and, and comfortable within the industry. That's a good point. And I think our actually next question relates to what you just said, uh, Rob, as far as kind of understanding how the plant protein side or crop production side interacts with the animal protein side, right? Because at the end of the day, even if you produce most of our protein sources from plants, there is the byproducts that Martin mentioned that need uh, recycling, need reusing. And, and there's, you know, the animal system allows us to do that. And we know that, you know, even with a large number of people move over to the plant side, they're still going to be interested in animal protein. And the nutrition it provides cannot be easily replaced with just peas, let's say, or, or, or you know, or legumes. So, there, you know, that crop livestock interaction, that uh, that's going to be uh, essential. So uh, one of our um, viewers asked a question, I would say, in that, in that space, can sustainability be defined? a steady state of CNN in the soil? If so, what are the consequences for crop and animal production? So I know that Martin mentioned uh, nutrient utilization and NNP uh, in the environment before, so maybe I'll let him take a stab at this. Uh, what would you say uh, to, this, to the questioner, Martin? Um, I, I think um, I, I think the two uh, the, the crop animal production these two are, are actually interrelated they are interconnected um, and and that's something that um, I think as a faculty we've been uh, interested in for a long time through the National Center for Livestock and the Environment um, because we feed animals yes our goal here is to try and produce animal protein. But um, clearly, there is a very important resource that we also generate in the process of uh, producing animal protein in the form of uh, livestock manure, which is a loaded uh, resource with a lot of nutrients that crops need. So, um, so the application of manure to the soil um, and maintaining that uh, the carbon nitrogen uh, ratio or the phosphorus content in the, in the, in the soil uh, is important for crop production. And therefore, uh, trying to have that cycle uh, or that loop of nutrient cycling through the livestock, back to the soil, to the plant, and back to the animals is absolutely important, um, especially within a production environment where we would like to, um, uh, for example, minimize that the supply chain and use what is around or what is available in our locality so that we don't bring in nutrients, we utilize what is uh, what is available. I think this is absolutely important uh, for both crop and uh, livestock uh, production. Yeah, so true. And uh, Anna, you mentioned that some of your funding comes from crop commodity groups, you know, barley cluster, you mentioned soybeans and canola and so forth. So that in itself is an indication that co-products from those sectors are important feed ingredients for poultry. In your case, you work a lot with poultry, but also swine. So um, did you want to share your thoughts on that? How effective uh, that integration needs to be to truly be sustainable? Yes, of course. Um, uh, the problem is that the, that the food industry, uh, by producing food, creates the byproducts, which will not be really useful for human consumption. That's why animal livestock production is needed as, a, as a basically the only way of, way of recycling those products. They quite often 
carry quite, quite a really, really good nutritional value, which has to be just enhanced, I may say, just. We're working on this just part. So, uh, so this is this is very important to sustain the entire circularity of the of the food production, and then in and uh, and uh, so if I could also sort of like go back to the previous previous topic, we talk about some something something in the future for the for the research. Um, we always have to be ready for challenges and we see challenges. Climate change change will be the challenge. Developing certain strategy to assist animals to to deal with the heat stress, to deal with the with the outreach of the bacterial or viral diseases. Bioactive bio ingredients or bioactive com uh, components will definitely support this, therefore, we have to really see how it um, uh, how it could be useful, right? So that's another na, 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 another uh, uh, way to see sustainability and animal health. As I said, we all care about animals. Um, they they produce how they produce how they're healthy, but but yes, well, once again, that that is very critical to to make sure everything. Um, is uh, is um, we, we will go towards the circular uh, uh, processing, so there's no really waste generated. Right, great, and that that speaks to both more sustainable practices, but you also mentioned adaptation to future changes, right, in the environment and temperature, maybe access to uh, certain nutritional sources, water, etc. So I, I think yes. just that adapting to that is going to be a challenge, no doubt. There is a question from the audience. I'm going to share it with you now. It says, could you share a, a few examples of successful collaborations, particularly those involving the translation of research findings? So I think one of you mentioned, I can't recall now, that, that that's a critical part of a good collaboration, right? Understanding how to disseminate knowledge in a way that makes sense for both sides. Uh, is there any specific example you can think of uh, when it comes to translation or dissemination of research findings that you have worked together on. Uh, maybe I'll start with uh, Rob in this, in this instance. Can you think of any such example, Rob? I can think of lots. Uh, so I need to, need to kind of narrow it down to one, one that pops into mind that's um, germane to what uh, Anna was saying is, um, you know, the work that was done in a collaborative fashion and a collaborative partnership uh, within a project uh, through the University of Manitoba Department of Animal Science, as well as through Chicken Farmers of Canada, specifically through uh, Canadian Poultry Research Council. And the focus of that was uh, looking at these bioactive compounds from, uh, from a, uh, you know, an undervalued uh, commodity stream. And the research uh, that came out of that was converted into a viable product that was put into the market that uh, you know was one of used across the country here in Canada for antibiotic free production, used around the world for antibiotic free production for mitigating health, mitigating disease, um, and and so from a, a you know translation from converting an idea into a product that was one of the translations that came through as well as you know, the opportunity for uh, Anna and for Dr. Slominski, you know, to, to, to talk to the industry about this innovation, why it's different, you know, how you can use it, what are the benefits, um, you know, what was the idea uh, and, and what was the challenge that was there and, and, and what, how did the, how did the parties come together to, to address it and, and what were the hurdles that were jumped over and the milestones that were met, all this sort of thing uh, is a great example of that. And, you know, and we think of this sort of thing as happening you know, in a two year period, you know, you start the project, you run the study, you get the data, you put a poster together and, and, and you get a product and, and everything's great, but really it's a, it's a longer process. And, and this, that example that I was thinking of, you know, was over the course of seven, eight years. Uh, and the culmination of that is, is, um, is that those examples of translation that I, that I just listed out. Oh, that's a great example. And the fact that that product is now available internationally, globally, right? And uh, right across Canada. And I imagine just having to make sure that the knowledge that needs to go along with the product, right? The user needs to know how that works, that you are having 
academic partners along the way that can explain this at conferences and meetings, maybe commodity group meetings, is critical. You know, and not not to say that customers won't trust their feed companies or or their you know commercial suppliers, but having scientists on board that can explain things, um, you know, in a way that makes sense, I think does help the cause. So thanks for that example. I think it's it's an excellent one. Um, let me see. There's some more questions here. Um, let's go with this one. Do you see any changes in animal nutrition industry and research after the pandemic or, uh, you know, I guess after COVID, I, I imagine that's, that's what the question is. Do you see any changes there at all? Uh, maybe because this is on the industrial side. Well, it says industry and research. So why don't I start with uh, with Martin first then on the research side? Do you see any changes between pre versus post pandemic? Um, I guess the biggest impact has been uh, um, to do with the supply the disruptions in the supply chain management. Uh, I mean, this has been a big problem. Uh, moving materials around uh, around the world that has been a big big issue um and um actually that what that also read is that then the, the prices of different commodities or dif different feed ingredients went uh, went quite high because of uh, this supply chain disruptions um and and with those disruptions then the price changes also um quite often going up um, were experienced, uh, which then drives up the cost of feed and the way we, we feed animals. So that has been probably the main impact is the disruption of the supply chain of uh, various ingredients that we use to formulate diets. And Rob, can you think of anything from the industry side uh, that's different post-pandemic versus pre-pandemic? Um, yeah, I think that was that, that was the example that kind of popped into my head, uh, a realignment of supply chain. Uh, I think we're more or less through it uh, in my experience. I don't think we're going to go back to how it was. Um, uh, yeah, I think the other one is is uh, maybe not necessarily at the from a you know a macro nutrition research. you know, I think we're still going to have to deal with the same uh, questions and, and answer the same questions. You know, what's the what's the nutritional value of of co-product A or B? Uh, but more of an alignment down to uh, overall biosecurity uh, and 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 really you know nutrition and how that relates in. And um, I think it, I think um, it, 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 if there's if there's something to be had from 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 dealing with that that window of time is that people are more aware of of transmission of 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 uh, disease vectors, uh, diseases themselves, and the vectors that that can move them around, and and so that that's something I've seen from a, an industry standpoint is is something that people are just talking about more, which is probably not a bad thing. Being more aware of biosecurity, and then it invariably leads to the discussion of well, how can we how can we um, advance our nutritional programs to maximize uh, uh, immunity in the case of you know uh, uh, an outbreak at a you know avian influenza for an example right um, so i think i think you know like i said one of the best or one of the positives that came out of that that block of time was just a, a, a broader awareness of 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 what we need to do to maintain the health of our animals and ourselves yeah and i think that public awareness right when uh COVID first started where it originated from how the interaction between animals and, and humans has changed over time densification close to contact and ultimately, all of that generates this biosecurity, uh, you know, kind of umbrella over these activities that everybody's way more aware of than maybe previously. Maybe you were, but you know, the ordinary public wasn't wasn't thinking about these issues the same way. So that's an excellent point, and I think we've moved forward in that area. Um, back to uh, questions. Let's see. We have one here on student training. What student training opportunities are? A, available or will become available in the coming months i bet this is an undergrad student looking for grad work anna uh, if you can just think about areas maybe more broadly are there opportunities for training for students that are um you know right in right there for them to take advantage of what do you see there yeah we we have to be a little bit patient with our grants coming up but definitely, um, we 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 may offer we may offer um, 
not only sense to stricter animal nutrition um, related training, but it, since it becomes really multidisciplinary, there will be a components of the microbiology. There will be components of the of the of the um, metabolomics. Will be a components of the sometimes even the animal welfare and uh, and and the physiology. So. So we're trying to be really multidisciplinary, and then, and of course, the biochemistry, nutritional biochemistry as well, um, as the, uh, some processes and metabolism is not as simple as we would think about. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, just to add to that, I, I mean, our students need to be aware that we hired a whole bunch of new professors into animal science recently. Mm -hmm. Some have expertise in animal nutrition. Some others deal with microbiome, um, deal with digital technologies. There'll be opportunities for those students to receive further training in any of those groups. But I think the, the collaboration we're talking about today remains strong, and I'm sure there'll be opportunities there uh, for student training. If I can go back maybe for one last question, um, back to slide. Uh, Crystal, can you pull that up for us? Because we're reaching close to the end of our time. Great, thank you for that. So maybe I'll go with the uh, communication bit. How do we communicate the benefits of enzymes used and their role in a circular bioeconomy to the public to help inform decisions regarding meat in their diets? So this goes to our previous conversation on, you know, social license to operate, consumer preference. And uh, I know you work on enzymes, so maybe it's, it's a, you know, it's something you want to, Take a stab at how does that the, the clarity in that area help us communicate to the public uh, the right messages around animal uh, and, uh, production and meat uh, consumption? So, Rob, do you want to take a stab at that? It's hard. Um, I'll be honest. We've been trying. We, we've been not trying. We have been doing this for a long time. And if you go back, it's it it it's actually starts at a very very basic level explaining what an enzyme is you know uh defining that putting that in uh, high level scientific terms for other researchers to think about uh and putting it into call it layman terms so that uh the people that you know have about you know 30 30 minutes of spare time a week to think about novel things that it's it's disseminated into simple bites that are easy to digest so that's where we've started uh and then we build on that we build on the you know, the, the what it is, you know, the why it's important. Uh, we can use those enzymes to facilitate increased levels of co-product usage, which then leads to reduced cost per, you know, cost per unit of gain and ultimately more sus back to sustainable, sustainable profitability for the producer, sustainable profitability for the processor and the retailer all the way out to, to the end consumer. And, and, and you know, ad adjunct to that um, is the, the other benefits you get along the way, not just from a, you know, a, a use case of, of improving profitability, but a use case from improving health. And, and we, you know, this, this collaboration was one of the first to demonstrate the, 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 the co-use case of, of health uh, that could be gained from the use of enzymes. And so we, we spiral that out uh, the best we can into, uh, into the industry. And, and actually it's, it's compared to what it was say 10 years ago, it, it actually is, uh, a little bit easier simply through forums like this um and, you know the various social platforms etc uh, people are used to to consuming information in small bites and so you know we're, we're getting more accustomed to, to doing that and and getting the message out but you know it's i don't want to i don't want to say that we know exactly how to do it because uh everywhere i go you know we, there's always questions coming to me about enzymes so there's always there's always something you know more we can be communicating Right. And, and Martin and Anna, if you, you know, when you communicate with producers, let's say, or uh, with the general public in certain forums, do you find that knowledge around enzymes is sufficiently there for you to explain your area? Or do you uh, have to start from scratch to kind of tell them, hey, this feeding ingredient is, you know, is something fairly natural and this is what it does. How, how, how does that go from your, from your end? Maybe let's start with Martin. Is it how, do you find it challenging to communicate to the general public? Well, uh, I, I, I mean, it's, it's um, I think if we start by just indicating what is it that you can feed, for example, to a pig and what is it that you cannot. 
or right. what is it that the pig can handle and what is it that if the pig cannot handle on, on, on its own and what we can do to help that pig to better utilize that feed ingredient. And if you then show that relative to what it will do to animal performance and uh, mitigating feed costs, then it's a bit uh, easier to explain without going into the, the biology or biochemistry of how enzymes work. Um, it's simply uh, focusing on what the issue is and, uh, and how enzymes can be part of the solution to try and deal with that issue, which is often introducing a new feed ingredient, mitigating feed costs, reducing nutrient excretion and things like that. Then it's easier to discuss without going into the the very basic science of our enzymes actually work. Great. And final word goes to you, Anna, as far as communicating with the public. How do you um, I, I will echo what, what Rob and Martin said. Uh, uh, but what is important, people are interested. Thank and you. people are asking really, really good questions in relating to relation to the to the enzyme technology overall. I found it fascinating because if there was no interest, there were no questions. Means uh, it's not relevant. So, um, I, so, so I think we we there. The message is it's being already seeded. Right. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. I certainly enjoyed our conversation. Thank you very much, Martin, Rob, and Anna, again, for joining me today. And hopefully our audience learned uh, some new things and were able to engage in the way they, uh, they were happy. So thanks again, everybody, for joining me. And um, I would like to just end with a couple of reminders that we have a few more events coming up in the faculty uh, around our seminar series before the end of the year. And uh, certainly these events will be uh, distributed as far as notices go to our social media accounts, as well as on uh, uh, the Make Manitoba website. And please keep your uh, eyes open for those uh, other events that might be upcoming. So thank you again, everybody, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you.